Brilliant. So uh, thanks a lot uh, for having me and, and I regret not being here in person. Um, I will be presenting joint work with Tom Kirchmeier and Neos Torres Blas on uh, the relationship between football, alcohol and domestic abuse. Um, so I think I don't have to motivate probably as much uh, why this is an important question, why specifically maybe we're interested in football. Uh, if you've been following sort of the last uh, European and World Cup in England as well, uh, there's definitely sort of a history or stereotypes that uh, football hooligans or football fans tend to be quite violent uh, among themselves, among opposite fans of a different club and uh, also cause clashes uh, with the police. So this is sort of, I don't want to say a too typical, but uh, a, ra a rather common uh, appearance uh, in London uh, and British cities uh, when football games are on. And secondly, I think uh, football uh, tends to be associated with alcohol quite a lot. Um, so it is sort of common that uh, football fans tend to drink a lot, whether they're watching in, in the UK, specifically the football uh, games in the pub. It's, um, and then they tend to go on these binge drinking uh, days. Uh, so actually, for example, France uh, has introduced, uh, which the headline here shows from the Daily Mirror, for example, has introduced alcohol bans, uh, but also actually in the United Kingdom as well, uh, specifically drinking, um, drinking on the stadium while watching the game has been uh, forbidden uh, due to sort of the excessive drinking uh, around football games. Um, um, from qualitative work as well, there is a lot of into there is a, a lot of evidence or a lot of interviews that would point that uh, football um, and sort of the behavior around football could be a, could be a trigger to domestic abuse. So this is from victim testimonies uh, from re from qualitative research, but um, which are very which were sort of very motivating for us and, and quite powerful. I'll just read out the second one um, as well. Uh, a victim uh, Deb has said that also knew that if other guys in the pub if they lost a match. Uh, I knew their wives wouldn't be out at the weekend because they'd have a black eye or busted ribs or something like that. I just knew. Um, so very grim. Um, and I think this uh, this has been said sort of many times maybe today, but it is important to also um, put more emphasis on research in domestic abuse because one out of three women in the United Kingdom and today has been mentioned sort of worldwide report at some point having experienced domestic abuse, whether emotional or physical uh, in their lives. Uh, and at the same time, while this is fairly common, uh, one third, this also represents a huge um, and a sharp escalation point in a person's life. So it puts this individual, the victim, whether a man or a woman on a completely different uh, life trajectory. And for example, Binler and Kettle uh, have estimated significant and sizable economic uh, and specifically economic when it comes to, for example, for, when it comes to employment and welfare benefits as a result of the victimization and further psychological losses. Um, on the other hand, there is a, there is a bit of a research, there is research in criminology as well, and police forces have identified surges in domestic abuse reports following big sporting events, such as the World Cup, yet generally I think there is not comprehensive evidence on the size of the average effect and also sort of the mechanisms behind this, uh, which sort of motivated uh, our research questions, which particularly sort of wanted to estimate what are the average hourly effects of a football game on domestic abuse dynamics. Um, and then how does a football game affect different types of domestic abuse across different types of relationships um, and across uh, different types of timings of the football game? And then perhaps most importantly, uh, sort of what are the mechanisms behind this effect? Um, and there we target or we ask specifically two potential mechanisms, which is that, which I motivated in the beginning, this could be the role of emotions at the outcome of the game uh, that triggers the domestic abuse dynamics that we see. And this has been uh, found uh, and is the focus of Card and Dahl. Uh, or it could also be sort of the interaction with alcohol consumption, that um, football just acts as a sort of uh, initiator to alcohol consumption that in turn actually leads to uh, aggression. 
uh, the institutional setting of our research is uh, sort of the, the second or the, th the second largest uh, territorial police force in the United Kingdom, but also sort of the, the second largest county uh, and urban area in the United Kingdom, which is Greater Sort of looked into Manchester for football fans, uh, although do not ask me any specific questions about uh, the, the clubs, is that uh, football is extremely important and extremely salient uh, in, in Manchester. So for uh, Manchester United and Manchester City are two really big clubs that, um, that, that are kind of that origin in Manchester, that play games in Manchester. And in the city, there is a certain atmosphere where really football is like the dominant sport and a, and a very common uh, part of the everyday conversation. Uh, but this was also sort of complement, complemented with uh, the Greater Manchester Police uh, that has recorded, that records and has recorded really detailed data and has actually amazing uh, confidential data that we were able to gain access uh, to uh, completely with uh, vetting and sort of confidential access. Uh, so uh, the Greater Manchester uh, Police sort of released uh, eight years of crime and incident data from spanning from April 2012 to July 2019. And they allowed us to gain access to both the full incident data sets, but also the crime data sets. Then we're able to match that to the victims uh, and to the alleged perpetrator data sets um, among information on other characteristics as well, such as the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator. Over this period from 2012 to 2019, there is about 0.5 million domestic abuse incidents uh, during the seven, eight years. And we know a lot of uh, a lot of very detailed information or actually the full set of information that Greater Manchester records on these calls. Uh, but particularly for sort of our research, what's important is we know the precise timing that the call comes in to uh, the police. Uh, we know the exact location um, of the of the incident, and we have a series, and we know a series of flags, uh, so that both on um, the type of domestic, on whether it was domestic abuse or not, and what type of domestic abuse incident, for example, uh, it was. Or also, we know that we can match to every individual call. We can match victim and perpetrator characteristics as well. Uh, we are also able to see whether it was a repeated victimization, for example, um, whether alcohol uh, or drugs were involved as well. So these are very detailed uh, flags uh, for the, both the victim and the perpetrator. Um, and just for sort of general knowledge, so Jim Greater Manchester records nine cases of domestic abuse every two hours. So this is quite a common event, out of which around 50% or 4.5 uh, are among current partners. And 4.5 or kind of the, the remaining other 50% among ex-partners. So within domestic abuse, we both capture, so we're interested in exclusively in intimate partners, uh, but almost half of that will be current partners and the other half will be ex-partners. And if we break that down uh, around two out of 4.5, uh, current partners have some alcohol. So uh, alcohol kind of consumption is in around uh, 30 to 40% on average of incidents recorded. Um, we match that to football data during the same period. Uh, so we have, we have data on every single game, which is about 780 that was played by these two salient clubs, Manchester City and Manchester United. Um, we also know a series of information about the games, but most importantly, we know ex the exact timing of the game. We know it's a result. Uh, we know um, also that we kind of following also Card and Dow, we scrape uh, betting before game betting odds uh, from, be from several betting agencies uh, that will allow us to look at the emotional impact of a football game. Um, and there's a couple of perhaps interesting statistics around that, around games. They are played uh, all throughout the week. That's worth saying, uh, just for sort of having in mind an identification strategy. However, there is a higher frequency of matches on Friday evenings and throughout the weekend, but that's around 36%. So uh, the remaining 64% are spread out uh, throughout the week. 
and games are also spread out uh, throughout the day sort of so uh, around 37 percent are after 7 p.m but the remaining around 60 percent happen uh, earlier in the day whether in early afternoon or sort of mid-afternoon um, and a general uh, sort of our research is that, that design uses an event study, a different, different an, sorry, uh, an event study um, to tackle sort of the, the main issue of indigeneity, which intuitively in a very simplistic uh, terms could be that if all football games are played on Saturday uh, and Saturdays generally have higher incidence of domestic abuse, this could lead to a mid variable bias. Uh, so sort of to overcome this issue, we use uh, an event study with controls um, and a series of uh, very dynamic time fix effects that in our main specification include day of the week and hour of the day interactions and quarter fix effects. Um, so our identification assumption for estimating the causal effect of the games is that conditional on these time trends, um, the domestic abuse incidents would have evolved similarly over time in the absence of the game. And it is the presence or the start of the game that changes uh, the domestic abuse trends that we, uh, that we see. Um, and this is sort of the parallel trends assumption here is that before the start of the game, the uh, domestic abuse trends on a game day do not deviate from a non-game day. Um, this is, um, this is the research design just formalized in an estimation specification. Um, I guess I don't really have to uh, maybe clarify this or spend too much time, but our parameter of interests are going to be betas that are gonna be dynamic uh, all throughout the 24 hours of the day. So we'll be capturing uh, eight hours before the game and 16 hours after the game dynamically to look at uh, how the presence of a game changes. Um, and we've, as I've said, we were including a full set of time fixed effects that in our baseline specification includes uh, day of the week interacted with hour of the day and quarter fixed effects. Um, and our outcome variables, I'm going to discuss that in the results section uh, a bit slower, but uh, we look at uh, all domestic abuse incidents that were recorded in the two period that vary between current partners, between ex-partners, and then we also split among current partners with a male uh, perpetrator and female victim, with a female perpetrator and male victim, and then we break it down by alcoholized uh, state. So whether both are alcoholized, uh, just the perpetrator is alcoholized or it's a non-alcoholized perpetrator. Okay. Uh, so these are our sort of, uh, I'll show the results in a, in a set of graphs, uh, hopefully for sort of the simplicity of it. Um, I'm just going to spend a tiny bit amount of uh, on the first graph to just because it, you'll see it uh, in many different contexts. So um, uh, we always kind of debate the, uh, the line that you see here um, at zero is the start of the, the football game. Uh, and as I said, the green line, and as I said, we're looking at eight hours before the game and sort of in 16 hours after the game. Um, so uh, we've also uh, fixed the, the base or the omitted category to, for, ease of compare, or for ease of interpretation to the period uh, T minus one or the two hours before the game. Uh, for robustness checks, we have done or changed this to any type of um, time before, it doesn't really matter. This is just for ease of interpretation. So uh, the first, so this is looking at the effects of the start of the football game on uh, domestic abuse among current partners. These are partners that uh, are living together. They can be married uh, or just cohabiting. Um, so we see that first before the football game, sort of in the six to eight hours before the football game, there is no, um, Kind of the parallel trans assumption is satisfied, there's no differential changes uh, on domestic abuse. Uh, next, we see that in the time, in the exactly the timing of the football game, so when the football game starts and lasts about on average two hours, which is also why we look at two hourly intervals, we see that there's actually a decrease in um, domestic abuse, which is at the size of about 0.25 uh, uh, incidents per uh, hour, and this sort of corresponds to about a decrease of around five to six percent uh, relative to the to the average. 
Um, so this can be interpreted as well as sort of a substitution effect almost of football uh, on domestic abuse or that football, uh, football fans are busy watching the football game during the, the actual uh, during the actual screening of the game and hence uh, do not commit domestic abuse. However, we see that after this drop uh, in the hours um, sort of following the football game, um, the domestic abuse patterns increase and sort of they first increase about four hours after the game and then finally they're eight to uh, 12 hours after the game. So much later um, on the in, during the day. Um, and this corresponds to about an absolute increase of about 0 0.4, which is a, a relative increase for current partners around 10% uh, of the mean. Uh, what's important perhaps, and I'll, I'll get to a bit of these results and interpretations on the timing as well, uh, but also we were sort of, you could imagine or you could uh, ask that this is somehow a spurious correlation affected by exactly the timing of the game that uh, also correlates to perhaps patterns in domestic abuse. So one of the things we did to check that is to verify uh, the effects on ex-partners. So here the outcome is not current partners, but is uh, ex-partners. And if we look at the effect of a football game on ex-partners, we see that this is generally uh, very flat. Uh, so ex uh, domestic abuse committed on ex-partners around the game is not affected uh, at all. There is a tiny bit, oh, I think sort of an increase very late, uh, but overall this is kind of, uh, we cannot reject the null hypothesis uh, of a significant effect. So this is sort of comforting to tell us that it's actually, or it tells us also about the mechanism that it's the presence of the current partners in the aftermath of the game that triggers the abuse rather than that it's actually perpetrators that are sort of seeking out and also sort of being violent and revenging also on their ex-partners. Uh, we also know exactly where the abuse happens, I should say, and that in 90% of times the abuse happens uh, within the home of the victim. Uh, and we can, and if we narrow it down to that, the results remain exactly the same. Uh, next, we were also interested in sort of examining, uh, similar to sort of the previous, whether this is, um, whether this is driven by, uh, so again, maybe something spurious or whether this is really driven by true kind of uh, fans of football and without sort of too many gender stereotypes, uh, male, um, kind of the male population in Greater Manchester tends to be much more bigger fans of football. So if we split the current partners uh, on the left-hand side to uh, across uh, of abuse of male and female, so male perpetrators and female victims, and on the right-hand side that you see in my graph uh, for of female perpetrators and male, we see that uh, on the right-hand side, uh, domestic abuse committed by female perpetrators on male victims is uh, completely flat, so not affected by, the, uh, by football games at all. And actually what is driving this, uh, and we see sort of the same patterns that I've showed in current partners, is actually a male perpetrators on female, victim, uh, female victims uh, and current partners. And next, um, what we've done, we've split among early and late games. One of the things that sort of motivated us to, to do this was also sort of the patterns that we, that we saw is that the, the effect definitely wasn't immediate. The effect sort of actually trigger starts much later in the day, which was actually something that uh, police wasn't aware of at all. Um, so we were kind of wondering uh, what drives this. So we split um, the sample among games uh, played earlier in the day. This is before 7 p.m. This is about 55% uh, of the games uh, or 60% of the games and uh, games played later in the day, which you can see on the right hand side. Uh, we also, when you look at uh, these two, it sort of shows that uh, early games are those that really trigger that leads to the domestic abuse patterns that we described. So late games, again, um, don't really lead to a significant uh, effect. Okay. Um, and I'll speak Five a bit. Uh, okay, perfect. Yes. Thank you. Um, and finally, I guess we were interested in really sort of understanding the mechanisms of these effects. So uh, on average, one third of domestic abuse perpetrators are under the influence of uh, alcohol when the incident was recorded. So here to check, uh, sort of as I motivated in the beginning, we wanted to check whether 
this is uh, through heightened emotions or through the increased consumption of alcohol. And theoretically, although sort of the kind of the simple theoretical expectations would be that if uh, increased emotions are the main channel, then you would imagine in general psychological literature says that um, emotions are strongest in the immediate. So we would expect that then the increase in domestic abuse should be immediate and should be stronger for unexpected results. Um, so this is sort of um, as Cardindal find. On the other hand, if alcohol is sort of the main channel, then we would imagine that the increases in domestic abuse should occur after a few hours, should be present only for obviously alcoholized perpetrators, while non-alcoholized per perpetrators should not be affected. So guided by this, we try to test this in data. So what we do is we split um, we split the timing uh, of we split these early games with perpetrators with alcohol and without alcohol. And again, uh, you can really see that on the left hand side when we when our outcome is uh, looks at uh, perpetrators that uh, have consumed alcohol, this is really driving the full effect. So we see very statistically significant and very large economic magnitudes here. So in the peaks, domestic abuse. Uh, on average increases by around 25% uh, of the baseline mean. On the other hand, even for early games, there is absolutely no effect when alcohol is not, uh, when alcohol is not present in the perpetrator. For late games as well, regardless of really whether there's alcohol or whether there's no alcohol, there is no presence. There, we don't see changes in domestic abuse uh, patterns. So sort of going back to this, it's really kind of the main finding here is that early games that occur or start around 3 to 5 p.m., that would be sort of the mode starting point of our games, trigger a day of binge drinking. Uh, and a day of inc very high increased alcohol consumption that eventually, once these perpetrators come back home from the pub, leads to uh, cycles of intimate partner violence. So it's not necessarily just the presence of football games, but it's really when football games and alcohol interact together. Um, and again, very briefly, so we also have sort of tried to replicate the analysis by Cardindal, which is that we looked at pregame expectations uh, by betting odds and eventual results and defined an upset loss, an upset win, a close loss, close win, predicted win or predicted loss, um, and looked at whether uh, domestic abuse patterns that we've seen vary or differentially vary for these six categories. In brief, I can show if there is time in the appendix as well, we don't find that this actually changes the size of the increase in domestic abuse. Um, and uh, we also don't find that this changes sort of the patterns in alcohol consumption either or alcohol, alcoholized domestic abuse either. So we actually don't find very strong evidence that for football games in this context, it is the pregame expectations that matter, but would really, um, yeah, what we find uh, essentially is that uh, the effects are driven by male and female abuse among current partners and present only when the perpetrator is under the influence uh, of alcohol. Um, so the magnitude is the strongest when the game has an earlier kickoff time, allowing longer alcohol consumption in the aftermath of the game. Uh, and I'll just finish off by saying, because I think we, uh, one of the reasons why, uh, apart from actually the academic interest, uh, this project has been really interesting is that we have been working with policymakers as well. I think that was discussed uh, in the keynote lecture as well, uh, which is quite, which is quite nice because um, it. I think that some of there are some policy implications that are important. Uh, on the one hand, to the police, they were sort of surprised to know because a lot of the a lot of the policing around football happens around the matches and kind of around perceptions of decreasing fights and antisocial behavior directly after a match. But what actually this shows is that we should also be thinking about what happens much later on at the home where intimate partner abuse happens. Um, and then also on the other hand, actually sort of showing that it's not necessarily just football that really matters, but it's really the interaction of football and uh, long alcohol consumption that triggers uh, violence among male perpetrators. Uh, yeah, and uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I will uh, comments and our, if you don't get it, I know it's very late. <laughs> so comments are very welcome and questions on my email as well.